But anyway, we were in the car, and uh, Elvis always, you know, he had a, they'd have an ice bucket in there, and they had a towel. And uh, I always sat in the jump seat facing them, and, and Joe would sit on one side of him. And then his girlfriend at that time was Ginger. And then Elvis would put his head back and then put an ice pack on his, his eyes. Uh, and uh, he would sit there for a moment. And then the first question he always asked was, how was the show? Was the sound good? Do you think the fans enjoyed it? You know, he was just ultimately consumed with, uh, with his fans. And he loved them, and he wanted to give them the best that, that he could. And I think he did, actually, for as long as he could, as an aside. But in any event, uh, uh, we were talking. And he looked at me and said, he said, I, he said, I want you to have that guitar. And I said, what guitar? He said, well, the one I was playing up there. It was a Martin D40, big dreadnought. Uh, and I had, couple, I had an old Gibson that he'd give me kind of beat up. And he said, you need a better guitar, so you can have that guitar. And I said, okay, thanks, Elvis. And didn't think any more about it. And um, we get back to Memphis, and Ricky and David Stanley and those boys were unloading the plane, uh, you know, Dean, Dean Nicopolis. And they were unloading, and they said, well, what do we do with this guitar? And I said, well, Elvis gave it to me. And so they said, okay, so they hand me the guitar. Pardon me, my phone is ringing. I, I'll just, let me silence it. And uh, as long as it's not my stockbroker. <laughs> I hope everything went well this week. Yes, sir. But, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, they hand it to me, and I take it home and put it in my closet. And I just don't think any more about it. Well, that was in June. Elvis died in August. And after that, and after the funeral, I, uh, I began to realize that I might have something that's, you know, momentous here. Uh, so I went and saw Vernon, and, uh, and Vernon gave me an affidavit uh, stating all these facts and others to authenticate it. And the Martin Guitar Company, I had the serial number and everything, and they, uh, they, uh, they gave me uh, letters of authenticity. And then I just put it back. I didn't know what I wanted to do with it. And I went back to work and went to school at night. And about a year or so, year and a half later, I was in school and I was just about to run out of money. And uh, you know, it was a long haul at night. And uh, so all of a sudden I get a telephone call through the Sheriff's Department from the National Enquirer. And they had been tracing this guitar because it was the last guitar that he played. And it had, on the back of it, it had plastic residue from his belt buckle from the CBS lights because it was a CBS TV special. And so uh, they wanted that guitar. And they ended up giving me $8,000 for the guitar. It was about a $600 guitar, you know, which I thought was a fortune at that time in 1980. So um, I ended up paying off my, all my law school debt and finished law school. So I tell everybody Elvis put me through law school. <laughs> and I'm grateful for that. Yes, sir. So uh, fast forward, you get a call from a guy that yeah. has the guitar. Yeah, a guy named, uh, let's see if I've got his name, Jeff Ruby, I think his name was. And uh, he had acquired the guitar from the woman who won it. Uh, apparently the National Enquirer did a contest. And if you bought a, a year subscription to their newspaper, then you got a, an entry into the lottery to win this guitar. And this lady had won it. And uh, this fellow, I'm a judge in Memphis by this time, and he calls me up and, and he wanted me to come to uh, Cincinnati and to authenticate it. So I did. I went up there and I met Johnny Bench and Chris Collingsworth, sports figures in Cincinnati. And we had a nice dinner and they had a big glass case with my guitar in it and all these, uh, the provenance was all there. And uh, so we're, we're chatting and uh, uh, I, I, did, I did ask him what he paid for the guitar. And uh, without saying on camera what it was, it was a, a, an amount a lot larger than what I had gotten from the National Enquirer. So when I tell that story, I always end it with, don't come to me for investment advice because I'm clearly not the right person. <laughs> but, but when you, you, when but you sold it, $8,000 was a lot of money. It was a lot time. of money. And yeah. you know, the way I look at things like that is that it, it served their purpose at the time. Uh, it, it made Elvis feel good to give something away because that's what he loved to do. Uh, I loved having it. Um, and it served a purpose for me, and then it served a purpose for the National Enquirer, and it served a purpose for the man that bought it. So I, I look at it like it's a lot of things, um, Billy, with, uh, with Elvis, it just keeps on giving. And, and, the, and the other side of that is, is that, that one gift that he gave you ended up creating 
a a lifelong law career for you correct that that moved you into other music endeavors that's correct that were even i mean giant music endeavors yeah i mean certainly nothing that that i would have thought about I, but i'll t and i'll tell you though i often uh when i was in the music business and and had the record company there were many many times when i would look back and think about what elvis did on stage uh, uh, I, I, my, my sister married David Foster, and I was doing some legal work for him, uh, and I ultimately moved to California in 1998 and became vice president of business and legal affairs for Warner Music Group. And we had a, a joint venture called 143 Records, and uh, we signed Josh Groban when he was 17. I had to sign him and get a uh, minor settlement approved in court and all of that. And then we had Michael Buble as our artist. And um, so we had a good run. And uh, during that period of time, I developed a little bit of an ear where I could actually hear people sing in pitch and in tune and what the right tempo was. And of course, I had a great teacher in David Foster. You know, had won 14 Grammys. So I, I, I absorbed all that. Uh, but then I began to compare these experiences to what that I saw as a young kid, really in my 20s with Elvis. And I realized that although like Felton Jarvis was Elvis's producer, really and truly, Elvis was his own producer because he had that ear and he could tell if something was wrong you know, on stage and not just in a recording studio, which I saw him do many times, but also on stage and where he would stop and he would say, wait a minute guys, that's too fast or that's too slow or that's in the wrong key. And, and you know, and he was right, he was right every time. Uh, Joe Garcia was his orchestra conductor, and he and I were very close friends. And uh, many years later, we would do a lot of tours together before Joe passed away. And Joe said the same thing. Joe was classically trained, uh, and he was the orchestra conductor for the Hilton and then went to work for Elvis after uh, Bobby Morris. But uh, Joe said that, uh, that Elvis had the, the finest ear for music for, for someone who had ne never been trained uh, in music that he, that he had ever known. So, you know, it all came full circle. It really did. He, he was just an extraordinary person, but an ex extraordinary musical genius, I believe. He truly was. Yeah, yeah he truly was a musical genius. Um, guy never had any lessons for anything and could play a lot of things. You know, one night we were on tour uh, and he had heard uh, the Righteous Brothers Unchained Medley and uh, he just sat down at a piano and moved Tony Brown over uh, to the extent where, it wasn't planned, by the way. You know, and the band didn't know what to do. They just sort of stood back, and so it was almost a cappello. You know, it was just Elvis at a piano and Charlie Hodge holding a microphone and him singing Unchained Medley. So, and we didn't know he could play the piano that well. Yeah, you know? just amazing. Yeah. Just amazing. Um, so what I gathered from all that is this one gift that Elvis gave of this guitar led to a law career that led to Josh Groban and Michael Bublé yeah. being signed to record deals. What that about is, that? That's crazy. It is crazy. No? That is crazy yeah. stuff. Well, you know, it's life, right? Yeah. It's life. and, and uh, you know, one, I love those threads, man. Well, one door opens, one door closes. And I, you know, I think so much in life is being in the right place at the right time, to, you know, to, to and, but you have to be prepared, you know, to be, to take advantage of those opportunities. And I had worked hard and studied hard and gone to school and, and, um, and read a lot and, and tried to, to apply myself and develop myself, as a lot of people do in life. And uh, that's what I tried to do. And I, was, I guess I was ready when the opportunities came. And even if I wasn't ready, I guess I said I was. That's and, right. and, I, and I took advantage of those opportunities. Well, and clearly you did very, very well. And I've man, been, that's, I've that's been, awesome. I've been very fortunate and I'm, and I'm grateful for uh, every opportunity that I've had. And, I, there is a saying that Elvis used to say. He said many things that, that I like to remember from time to time. But he, he would say, if, if you see a, a turtle on a 10-foot pole, he didn't get up there by himself. And I think that's true in life, is that no matter how much success any of us have, it's, it's really presumptuous to say, oh, I did all of this, because none of us did it all. We did it with the help of friends and family, and we did it with the help of opportunity and breaks. Um, and I have been very, very fortunate in, in that regard, and I'm grateful for it. That's awesome, man. I thank you so much. What is your, and what, let's, let's just do one last question, and that would be, and, and I haven't prepared you for this, but what is, let's say, what is your fondest memory mm -hmm. of Elvis? Maybe a personal memory or just some little, little thing between you and him. Well, you know, there, there are over 
five year or so period and living right next to Graceland, um, there are a lot of things that I think about, you know, picking up Lisa Marie for him and bringing him, her back to uh, Graceland, you know, uh, because he and Priscilla were divorced, but they shared custody. Um, the, uh, the, oppor the opportunities that I had with him when he bought me motorcycles, bought me cars, bought me a house, traveling with him, going to Hawaii on the last vacation, you know, Pittsburgh, uh, New Year's Eve 76, I remember that so well. So many things. But the truth is, beyond all the physical and material manifestations of Elvis's generosity, beyond all that, what I miss the most uh, to this very day and what I treasure the very most are the moments, and they weren't a lot of them, but there were moments when it was just me and Elvis, and he wasn't Elvis Presley, he was just Elvis. Uh, I used to say, and this is a euphemism, so it's not technically true, but I miss the guy with peanut butter on his pajamas. Now that's not really true, he didn't have peanut butter on. But there were times when Elvis would call up, because you know I lived right next to him. So particularly in those years when I wasn't working for him and he would be off not on tour, well everybody, Joe Esposito lived in California, Joe Mascale was in Nashville, and uh, you know everybody lived out of town. But I lived, Billy Smith lived in Graceland, Charlie Hodge lived in Graceland, I lived next door. And pretty much that was it. So I would go over there, he'd call sometimes in the middle of the night. And he would always just, I'd answer the phone, he'd say, it's me. He never said, hey Sam, how you doing? How's the kids, you know? But he'd say, hey, it's me, what are you doing? And I said, right, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm just sitting up here. He said, why don't you come over, we'll talk. I said, okay. So I'd go over and uh, go upstairs. And he had all these books out. He was reading everything, you know, on astrology and Eastern religion and Judaism and Christianity. And, uh, uh, and we would sit and talk. And he told me a story one night that I just broke up laughing. He said he went to the Paramahansa Yogananda's uh, self-realization center one time. And this is Elvis telling me, we're sitting upstairs in his bedroom. He's sitting cross-legged with blue silk pajamas on in his bed. And I'm sitting in a chair beside the bed. And we're looking at all these books, and there was a book from uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. Who, I didn't even know who that was. You know, I'm, I was a Southern Baptist boy, right? But he says, well, let me tell you this. He said, I went out there one time. I said, you did? He said, yeah, I flew out there, and they've got this place called Self-Realization Center. It's, it's out there, and it's still there, by the way, because I lived in California, and I actually know where it is. It's on Sunset right there at Pacific Coast Highway. And it was founded back in the 40s, and it's still there with monks, and it's got a meditation garden and all that. And he said, and I showed up, and he said, I had, uh, I had a, a cross on, and I had a, a, uh, an Egyptian ankh, because he always wore that one, and he, ha uh, and he had a, um, uh, a five-star uh, star, star of David. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I said, y you wore all that? He said, yeah. And he said, the monk looked at me and said, son, are you confused? <laughs> and that's when I broke up laughing. And Elvis said, I told him, I said, oh, no, sir, I just don't want to miss out on heaven on technicality. <laughs> and see, I, that was really Elvis's look, outlook. He was a Christian. There's no question. He was raised a Christian. Uh, and when he passed away, I'm certain that, that he was a Christian and, and believed in the afterlife as Christians do. And I believe that he got that afterlife. But he was an inquisitive person. He had a broad mind. So those are the types of things we would sit and talk about. And he would talk about growing up in Tupelo. We came to Tupelo one time. He, he, uh, uh, we were sitting there talking. He said, I'm going to take you down and show you the Circle G Ranch. And I think he had sold it at that time. So we drove by, and of course we couldn't get in, but he said, that's where it is. And we just kept on driving, and we, we were in a black Stutz, and we drove right through Tupelo. And he said, this is where I grew up. And we drew by his house, and he said, that was my house. And just me and him in the car, and nobody even noticed us. You know, and we turned around and drove. Little, little moments like that where you forget that this, this man can stand in front of 20,000 people and mesmerize them. This was a human being, a person. Um, and you know, Billy, when I get to talk about Elvis and I do interviews and q and I always try to work something in to talk about Elvis's humanity um, because people know who he was uh, iconically. I remember one night we were talking and he was kind of blue about his relationships and you know nobody really knows who I am and I said man you know Elvis um, you know people love you man they love you they know you all over the world he said no 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 he said they know that guy on the stage they don't know me and it's really true you know you have to become another person when you're 
when you're performing like that. And that's what he was on the stage. But he was, uh, he was a different person when you could just sit and talk with him. That's the guy that I miss, and those are my most cherished moments. Sam, this is incredible, my <laughs> friend. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You don't know what this means to me, and this is going to mean to the, to the fans and well, good. subscribers. Yeah, good, good. And, man, I'm so happy that I was able to sit down well, with thank you. you Billy. Thank this you, is yeah. an, It's an yeah. honor. It's well, serious, serious business. It's an honor. Well, I'm thank happy, you so I'm happy much. to do it. Yeah, I, just tell my story. Yes, sir. It's an incredible one. Thank you so good. much. You're welcome.